myself by not being able to refute whose proposal where is uh, Kevin. Okay, so he proposed uh, the following that uh, you remember the problem is uh, so we have our timeline right from say 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. and uh, we have activities uh, taking place uh, okay and uh, some of them overlap and uh, we have to choose the largest set in terms of cardinality only, right? Not duration, but just the largest number of non-overlapping uh, activities. Uh, and that's an excellent uh, example of a problem that shows that uh, even when greedy does work, sometimes the quantity that uh, uh, you are trying to locally optimize, uh, it's non-trivial to see which one it should be. Because it's very appealing to say, okay, whenever I choose uh, my activity, I should choose it so that it conflicts with the smallest possible number of other activities, because in this way I minimally restrict myself for the next move, uh, right? Looks like this should work, right? Because if each time I choose activity that rules out the minimal number of other activities, looks that in this way I would always find optimal solution. But unfortunately, this is not the case. And that's example uh, when this fails. So you have these four activities, then you have a whole bunch of activities conflicting with these two, a whole bunch of activities conflicting with these two, and one activity that conflicts only with these two, right? So this activity would have been chosen by, if you are greedy with respect to this criterion, right? Because this way it rules out only this activity and that activity, only two activities. Well, choosing anything else uh, will rule out more activities. But notice that uh, now uh, these two are out. I can choose uh, at most one of these groups, uh, right? Because they overlap. Um, and here, I can choose only one of these because they also overlap. So I would end up with only three activities. But uh, if I choose uh, these Notice I can choose these activities and have four of them non-overlapping. So even though this activity rules out the minimal number of other activities, unfortunately it rules out the wrong ones because interference between other activities uh, also comes into the picture, not just sheer number, right? But notice that our algorithm that says always pick one that ends earliest, in fact, would, uh, uh, so it would choose this activity, then it would rule out all of these, choose that one, it would rule out this one, choose this one, rule out all of these, and finally choose that one. So it would, in fact, uh, find uh, the... Now, and this shows something. It shows how important it is uh, to have a proof of correctness. Because if you ask me on the street, right, uh, without me having read about this, whether the choosing one that rules out uh, the minimal number of all other activities, I would say, gee, yeah, that, that sounds really the way to go. But uh, uh, so this is why you have to uh, actually come up with a proof that doesn't have to be formal, but it has to be good enough to persuade you that, in fact, this is uh, the optimal solution, right? And uh, as we will see as we progress uh, through the material, uh, the 
most common way of uh, showing optimality is uh, by uh, this cut and paste algorithm uh, method in which you gradually convert uh, your uh, optimal activity into the greedy produced activity, right? So that's the best way to see for you if, uh, uh, if you have on the exam or in general later when you are practicing programmers, if you have a problem and you think greedy solution works, a good idea to see whether you are correct is to show that if you assume that you have any other, like any other solution, you can morph it gradually into the one produced by greedy without deteriorating the quality of the solution, right? And so how was this here if you always choose uh, uh, one that ends earliest? So it's typical cut and paste. You see, you simply say, assume that I have a optimal solution. It's a solution that has the largest number of non-overlapping activities. So, so it is optimal in the sense that it has the largest number of non-overlapping activities. Then you say, now, I am going to show that I can morph this solution into, a, into my greedy solution so that in each intermediate step, it never dropped, it, the number of activities never decreased, right? How do we do that? Well, you simply, and okay, so in the book, <coughs> including the Kleinberg and Tardos book, that is actually much more, much easier to read um, than uh, uh, Lasersohn, uh, you know, the, the official textbook, but I don't know for what reason, uh, the, even there, the rigor uh, is kind of, uh, the, the na naturalness of the proof was satisfied, uh, sacrificed for some form of a rigor. So uh, the, the somehow computer scientists prove things in a very kind of formalistic way, uh, essentially kind of making the whole proof appear. It's kind of maybe easier to verify the correctness, but it becomes less uh, intuitive. So we will actually give uh, uh, more, more kind of informal proof than uh, uh, examples given in either of the textbook, but uh, uh, that uh, is clear to common sense uh, that the solution is correct, right? Um, so how do we do that? Uh, you simply say the following, okay, assume that this optimal solution has not been produced using the greedy method, right? What does this mean? Well, as I go through my intervals, eventually I will find a place at which the greedy was violated. So maybe the first one was indeed chosen to be the earliest ending. The second one was also um, chosen to be the earliest ending among those that are non-conflicting with the first one. But eventually I had to hit a point in which I chose something else, not the one that Greedy proposes. So I will ignore these guys because they are all according to the Greedy strategy. And what I am going to show now that I can massage my solution into the one in which greedy is not violated also at this place. Now, instead of going through formal jumbo mambo, I can simply say, now, once I made it compliant also at that step, I can simply repeat the procedure until I make it fully compliant, right? But instead of, uh, th this is kind of clear, if uh, I have, if any uh, um, solution that is compliant with greedy for k, first k steps uh, can be morphed uh, into an optimal solution that is compliant also at k plus first step, then it's perfectly intuitively clear that uh, 
in this way you can finish out the whole thing and produce a totally greedy solution, right? So now, uh, assume that here greedy was viable. Okay. Now, we find what greedy would propose. Greedy would propose any activity, an activity that is non-conflicting with these activities, right? That ends the first, right? Now, I am now simply throwing out this, inter this activity and replacing it with a greedy solution. And I claim this new solution, clearly it is still optimal because the number of intervals is exactly the same. All what I have to show that the new solution is also non-conflicting, that it is a solution. Why is that so? Well, this guy clearly cannot conflict with any of the previous activities because greedy always chooses as the next interval one that is non-conflicting with the previous ones. So this interval cannot interfere with anything on the left. But clearly also, it cannot interfere with anything on the right. Why? Because anything on the right does not interfere with the original choice. And the new choice ends before this one. So since the beginning of all subsequent activities is after this end, and this end precedes it, then clearly all the beginnings of other activities must be after the end of the one proposed by Greedy. So it's crystal clear so that in this way you produce a new solution with equal number of intervals, but that is compliant not on just two first places, but at three places. And now you simply say, rather than go through formal arguments, you simply say, carry on until you make it into fully greedy solution. Because we showed that if I can make it compliant, if there is one compliant at first k places, then there must be one compliant also at k plus first case. And if you go through this, then it's clear that greedy is, uh, is optimal. Right? But it's, I say, this kind of, this is, I wouldn't call it even a proof, it's kind of intuitive justification, right? But it is necessary precisely because of this. You know, just saying, one of you proposed the, the term, well, it's obviously the best because it interferes with the fewest number of them. It's not good enough because here, this one interferes with the fewest number of activities. But picking it can still ruin optimality of the solution, right? So greedy is a, usually the method, most of the time, greedy method is a relatively simple choice. But there are pitfalls that you have to very carefully choose. What is the quantity you are greedy with respect to? So here, you always choose ones that ends earliest. And then you are safe. Okay, any questions? Do you, you understand the cut and paste method, or whatever you want to call it? It's morphing mutation method, if you will. So simply, to verify that your solution is optimal, say, let me look at a optimal solution, and then let me morph it into a greedy solution. How? Well, assume that my solution agrees for the first k steps. Then k, if k plus first step is non-greedy, pick the greedy solution and show that the replacement of this non-greedy choice with the greedy choice still gives a solution, and clearly it has to be optimal because one uh, uh, element was replaced just by another element, huh? right? So it's clear how it works? Okay, so let's see. You know, when you do sufficient number of examples, uh, uh, you will be, uh, you will get more comfortable, with, like with anything else. Uh, so. 
because in previous courses you were not exposed to actually problem solving, uh, this must appear terribly hard. But it's like when you go to a doctor. You go to a doctor and you complain about something and he knows with huge probability what's wrong with you. What do you think? Why is that so? <coughs> Experience, he has seen many cases before. Of course, when I go to doctor, sometimes I explain symptoms that no one has ever heard before. <laughs> Uh, so, but the point is, it, with algorithm design, is the same story. Uh, if you haven't seen the methods and the ways of thinking uh, before, it looks daunting. But eventually, you buy the elementary tricks, and then the rest is obtained by clever modification of uh, uh, of uh, the methods that you know. And very seldom, you really have to think out of the box. Right, and then uh, you start Google company and make billions. Right? <laughs> okay, so let's see another example, minimizing job lateness. So we have jobs that are all of different, say, durations. Right, uh, so they are duration T1, T2, T3, say T4, and so forth. But you have also deadlines D1, D2, D3, D4. And then you want to schedule them. So the lateness of a job, say, first of all, um, uh, the lateness of a job is if, you, if the job is finished at uh, FI, right? Uh, then the lateness is of i is um, it is what it is f i minus d i if uh, f i is bigger than d i and zero otherwise. So if you complete your job right uh, after the given deadline for the job then this difference between the completion moment and the deadline is your lateness. Okay. And you want to schedule the jobs in such a way that the largest lateness is as small as possible. Right? So you look at all how late you are at all jobs, you pick the largest one, and this has to be as small as possible. Okay, for example, the book which I photocopied, scanned, and then emailed it to you, guess why I didn't put it on the website? Huh? <laughs> because... Uh, <laughs> um, so we will use uh, illegal kind of secret communication channels uh, to... Okay. So in the book, they first prove the following one. If you have an optimal solution, then there is also an optimal solution that doesn't involve any breaks between uh, consecutive jobs that are done. Is this obvious? You have a solution that has gaps. The claim is that there must be a solution that has no more lightness than your solution that doesn't have gaps. If you have gaps, what do you do? You schedule everything a little bit earlier. Can this increase uh, the lightness? Uh, no, because everything can be only finished earlier. But there it's proved uh, as a technical lab. And this is what I hate. They should say it is obvious that if you have gaps, you can remove them by scheduling everything a little bit earlier and no lightness will be increased. Uh, but instead of that, it's formulated at the theorem. You know, uh, Bill Wilson, my colleague Bill Wilson, calls this uh, uh, theorem envy. That computer scientists want to look, uh, uh, they envy mathematicians for difficult theorems, so whenever they get some statement, they call it a theorem, right? <laughs> and you know what envy Freud was thinking about, right? It's a little bit different. <laughs> okay, so 
What we want to show, that's a very interesting uh, example, because it's very tempting to use methods that come up with suboptimal results. For example, one can say, uh, maybe it's good first to finish the short jobs, uh, because they push the dead, uh, things as... But you see, if you have a long job and an early deadline, this is obviously a bad idea. Now, uh, interesting thing here in this solution is that this information is superfluous. And in fact, the greedy looks only at the deadlines <coughs> and schedules the jobs in the order of the deadlines. Okay? Now we want to show if we do that we will get an optimal solution. What is the idea? The idea is exactly the same as there, namely, I don't know, I call it cut and paste. The idea is uh, um, if the solution is not satisfying this, uh, this condition, namely that I always execute the job with the earliest deadline first, and uh, those with the later deadline of after that. Um, that this greedy method in this way so, uh, will produce equally good solutions. So what I have to show is uh, that if I have an inversion, right, namely here is the deadline bi plus 1 of the i job, and here is the deadline of, of the eighth job, right? But what I did was I executed the, uh, the activity, the job, uh, job um, I uh, first, and then somewhere here I executed job I plus 1, even though the deadline for job I plus 1 comes before the deadline for the job I. Okay. Now, what is the problem? So the idea would be, okay, if I violate this, I should somehow show that there exists a solution that there are no such violations, and it's optimal. One could say that should be easy. Why don't you just simply swap these two jobs? But the problem is, you see, if this job is longer than that job, putting it here, it will push everything between this way. And conceivably, it might increase the latencies of other jobs. And maybe I will produce something that has larger lateness in this way, right? So simple swap doesn't work because swapping two things will interfere with whatever happens between these two jobs. Everything will be pushed, right? Then we will have something like this. We will have here uh, something that looks, so this is job i plus 1, and then here we will have job i. And now notice all these activities, say if something started here, and now it will be starting somewhere here. Right? So it might increase its deadline, and who knows, maybe I will mess it up. In such cases, one trick always works. And we will see it applies also to dynamic programming. Right? And the idea is, if there are inversions in some order, right? then there must be inversions between two consecutive elements. Right? right? And that's precisely how bubble sort operates. In bubble sort, you only swap immediate consecutive inversions but at the end, you prove you end up with something that has no inversions whatsoever. So rather than swapping jobs that are non-consecutive, 
I will only swap jobs that are consecutive. And the good thing about consecutive jobs is there is nothing in between to be messed up. Right? And it's enough because swapping adjacent inversions is enough by bubble sort, eventually it will clear up all the inversions. Uh, so let's see why nothing bad happens. Uh, nothing bad happens because, uh, I will, for the sake of the camera, I will now erase this. Okay, hopefully I'm going to bug my admin to pay, post uh, the links uh, uh, to the to the lectures that uh, uh, this lady is uh, uh, filming. Uh, to I will send it probably through email because in this way uh, people from the outside of the university don't hear my dirty jokes, right? <laughs> and uh, so I don't have to. I can tell you. Um, uh, bad jokes, and also I can then confess that I was kind of scanning uh, copyrighted material, and, uh, you know, doing other dodgy, uh, dodgy things. Okay, so this will be our little secret. Uh, okay, so now, um, so what we want to show now is if you have two jobs that are consecutive, right? So here is um, finishing time fi plus one, here is finishing time fi, but the deadlines look like this. Uh, here is deadline uh, di, no, here is the deadline di plus let me see, am I messing it up now? Uh, and here I am now messing it up because here I said first is deadline di plus one, and here is deadline di, but here this is fi plus one, and this is finishing time fi for activity ai, and immediately next to it is activity ai plus one, which was finished after the activity with deadline D, uh, the I, um, even though the deadline for the I plus one was before. Now, between the, what are the laten, lateness here? Well, here is one, and here is uh, another one, right? Now, what will happen when I swap them? Well, when I swap them, nothing changes here. Here, this will become the finishing time uh, fi plus one star. And this here will become uh, f finishing time i star. So star after the swap. Okay, what can go uh, wrong now? And here are my deadlines. Uh, let's see what's the lateness, late, lateness of activity AI. Here is the LI. And what is the lateness of activity I plus one? Well, here is the lightness of activity uh, plus one. Doesn't L i go all the way to the end? You Doesn't uh, L i go to uh, no uh, L oh L i yes 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 sorry 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 it's here. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, the new one will be right at the very end. The new one ah. Oh gosh, sorry, I'm an autopilot. Huh? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking that this lady is filming me and I think, do I look like a Brad Pitt or not? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit distracting. Okay. Um, 
So um, let's see. So that's right. So here is now the because this is the new termination of uh, uh, A i, and this is the termination of L i plus one. Now, rather than giving some complicated mathematical proof, can this be worse than maximal lateness here? No, because in the original case, the lateness span over entire interval, right? While here, the both lateness is this lateness simply finishes before this interval, and this lateness starts later and finishes here, so it is, again, smaller than this interval. So maybe these were not the worst cases. Maybe, so it doesn't mean that you will improve the solution, right? Because the solution uh, asks you to minimize the largest latents, uh, and maybe the largest latents does not involve these two activities, but something else. But clearly, because these lateness, if latencies are only reduced, right? The largest lateness cannot increase because both of these latencies are smaller than the original lateness for the job I plus one, right? And of course, the lateness of job I plus one is smaller or equal than largest lateness. So without mathematical mumbo jumbo, it's enough to reduce it to the point when your common sense definitely tells you it's okay. You don't have to produce, you know, Euclid's elements proving everything from, uh, you know, trivial facts. For as long, the moment you see that you are fine, you are fine. So no reason to produce this step-by-step -step lemma one, two, three, four, in which each lemma is kind of uh, semi-trivial, but there are so many of them that you lose track uh, of what is happening. Simply, by inspection here, you can see this is the, the deadline, uh, the largest, larger of the deadlines in the beginning. After swapping, right, uh, the deadline of A i plus 1 moves this way, right? And this uh, deadline, because it starts after the i plus 1, it cannot uh, uh, be bigger than that. And lo and behold, uh, this is a sufficient justification that uh, uh, you can do the swap without uh, decreasing the quality of the solution. So, th th so this is the cut and, uh, cut and paste argument. So sometimes it's just... Uh, according to which step of construction you are, like in the first example. In this example, it is not according to where they first differ. Uh, you cannot say, okay, let me first find the first place where there is an inversion, right? Uh, and, well, actually, in this case, it would, uh, uh, they must be two. Do they have to be adjacent? No, they don't have to be a adjacent, so because the first one that has inversion can be inverted with something all the way up to here and can be inversions in between. So there you have to pick, but uh, the idea is the same. By doing the swapping of consecutive ones, uh, after at most n squared many steps, uh, right, just like in bubble sort, you will come up with one that has no inversions and you, the, the quality of the solution never decreased. Okay. So you can read this in these uh, uh, lecture notes that, uh, that I uh, sent you, uh, email you. Okay. Now another interesting problem that is uh, uh, also a very, very practical problem. It is uh, the k-clustering problem. What is k clustering? Let's see. You are simply given a complete graph. Right? You are given a complete graph. And distance with edges that are uh, weighted and they represent the distance between i, point i and j. So this is vertex i, this is vertex j, and this number tells you 
the distance between these two points. And you have a complete graph with all possible pairs connected and given the distances. Your task is to lump them into k clusters. Okay, so cluster 1, cluster 2, up to cluster k. In such a way that the minimal distance between any two clusters is as large as possible. So you want to lump the points in such a way that when so that what is the distance between two clusters? Well, it's the shortest uh, distance between the two points each belonging to the corresponding cluster. Okay? So you want to make these k groups as apart as possible to produce something that can be reasonably called a cluster. Yeah. Okay? So you are given k and you are given a graph g. So this is your g and you are given k. You have to somehow split your graph into k components so that the minimal distance between any two points in two different clusters is as large as possible. So we would like to do this by the greedy man. Yes? There should be only one connection between two clusters. No, 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 no. You consider all possible, uh, all points are connected and the, the, the value on the, the weight of the edge is the difference between these two points. So you want to make, the, to maximize the minimum of these, right? Because you want to make the lumps as apart as possible. Okay, so how would we do that in a greedy way? What would be the logical, what, which two points, no matter what you do, which two points should always be in the same cluster? The closest together. The closest together. Right? So what I should do is uh, I should put in the same cluster two points that are closest together. What do I do next? Which two points now go in the same cluster? The k points. Sorry? The k minimum distance. You have to find k minimum distance. Well, you want to, well, you don't know which ones will, uh, will be, uh, because you have to split them in the cluster, so they can be k, you know, k minimal distance might be still in the, in the same cluster, so one has to be a little bit uh, more careful than that. So, which next two points should definitely be lumped together? Two points that aren't in your original two vertices, but are as close as possible. Exactly. So you look now for two points <coughs> that are um, uh, that are not here. So next two points, the closest together, you lump them together, and you keep doing that. Say if I. Uh, uh, have produced something that looks uh, like this, and then, uh, and say, uh, uh, the next closest distance is between these two. Do I have to uh, draw a line between them? No, because I want to produce connected components, and this will tell me, right? Uh, uh, so I don't have to draw all the distances. What am I actually doing? Anyone can see? Hmm? So I simply look at the next pair. Say if the next pair is this point and that point. Ah, these two guys are fused together and this is a new cluster out of these two and I keep doing that. When do I terminate? And what am I actually doing here? Yes? You started with n clusters, or were they drawing or reducing it by one? Okay, no, no, there are no n clusters. Yes, so that one can see that exactly like that. I started with n clusters, and I keep doing that 
until I end up with the, not n, but k connected from moments. So, so I just keep doing that, keep joining that until there are k components. What is the another way of getting exactly the same thing? What am I doing when I join, keep joining the closest points? What is that algorithm? Hmm? Minimum spanning tree. It's Kraskal's algorithm for minimum spanning tree, except I don't iterate it until I have a single component. I abort it. I, it's essentially minimum spanning tree with the k minus one largest edges removed. Right? It boils down to that. Because how does Kraskal operate? It keeps fusing, you keep adding, you keep connecting the, you order the edges according to their weight, and you keep connecting clusters whenever uh, the next edge is across the clusters, you don't do anything if uh, um, the points are already in the same cluster. Okay. So it looks pretty obvious that it should be optimal, right? But given the previous example in which you, uh, we were choosing minimal interfering and messing it up, it's always good to verify that your solution is in fact optimal. How do we do? Well, assume that there exists a better solution, right? So assume there is some clustering with larger minimal span. And assume that it is not obtained by the greedy method, right? It is not possible that whatever uh, greedy produces is always only a subset of everything because this would result in non-covered uh, elements. So it must be then the case, then, that one of our components was stretching uh, between uh, two clusters of the optimal solution, right? Now, what do you think, what points uh, um, should I consider to uh, make a contradiction? So I'm assuming that optimal solution, there is a better solution with larger, larger uh, distance than what the, the uh, essentially Kraskal's algorithm uh, produces. Because it's not the same, uh, one of our components must have elements in two different clusters. Which point should I look to get a contradiction? What do you think? What causes the contradiction? Why this situation is not possible? Okay, what are the most interesting points here? The ones that join clusters. Exactly, the ones so that on the path, because we, uh, we produce essentially k trees in our uh, algorithm, there must be a path from uh, one point to the other point. These are the points of uh, largest interest, uh, of our interest. Why is this so? Uh, the distance between these two points must be smaller than the distance between the clusters, our clusters, because in our clusters, we always add edge, right? If it's the next minimal, we always choose the edge of the smallest weight. So when, once we terminate, we know that all the missing uh, points will be, all the points, that we, the distance between the clusters must be larger than the distance between any points in any cluster, right? Because we always add from the smallest to the largest, right? But this would mean that this distance 
is smaller than the distance between our clusters. Because the distance between our clusters is the first element that was not added. And this element that was not added is larger than all the elements that we did add. So because of that, this distance is smaller than the distance between our clusters, but it is the distance between two points in opposite clusters in, in, of two different components of the optimal solution. And thus it cannot be optimal because lo and behold we showed this distance is smaller than the distance between clusters produced by uh, the Kraskal uh, method. Okay, this is also in the, this um, um, shady kind of material that I emailed to you. Uh, we are going, okay, so we have to see, we will manage to finish greedy next week, so when do you want to find your paper? Oh, I will release today the assignment, uh, and we will go over the assignment uh, when we reconvene, uh, because that will help you do your uh, midterm. Uh, so the midterm will not be the first week after the break. Uh,